Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. We are now officially into the second quarter of 2023. I don't even want to talk about how that's even possible, but since the first quarter is behind us, I wanted to go ahead and do a quarterly wrap up. I think I'm going to be making this a series on my channel where at the end of every quarter I come on here to wrap up my reading for that quarter. So kind of talk about the best and the worst, provide some bookish statistics. I don't do super detailed statistics, but I do have a few that I like to keep track of and I would be able to go ahead and provide that here for you as well as update you on some of the challenges that I've set for myself and how I'm doing along with what I've been watching during that first quarter. So let's go ahead and get into it for quarter one. I don't really have a set way that I plan on talking about these statistics. So if they're kind of all over the place, I apologize. I'm just going to kind of go through the numbers with y'all and then we'll go from there. So in the very first quarter of 2023, I read 33 books. 27 of those 33 were listened to completely on audiobook, which is not a surprise. The vast majority of what I read these days is via audio. One of them was read via ebook and then five of them were a mixture. And so typically what that means is I was listening and reading at the same time, or there could be times when I was only reading or only listening, but they were a mixture of mediums. Another statistic that doesn't surprise me is that 30 of the 33 books that I read were adult and three were YA. I've mentioned this many times, but I'm almost completely moving away from YA. In fact, one of the only reasons why there's any YA on here at all is because I'm trying to wrap up a lot of series that have been in progress for many years. And a lot of those are YA, or there have been books on my TBR that have been on my radar for many years and I've never like thought to unhaul them or digitally unhaul them and I wanted to go ahead and see if I actually wanted to continue with them or things like that. So that's why there are as many YA on here as there are, which is only three. So I have a feeling that this is going to be a trend that continues throughout 2023 and that we see a vast gap between the number of adult books and the number of YA books that I'm actually reading. In terms of genres, I did have some diversity. One of them was a classic. I know that classic's technically not a genre, but I do classify it as a genre because if I am reading a classic, I'm going to just call it a classic. I'm not going to say, oh, this was a contemporary because it was a contemporary in the 1800. <laughs> I'm going to call it a classic. So one of them was a classic. Eight of them were actually contemporaries. They were basically contemporary romances that I read back in February for the Do I Agree with the Online Bookish Community romance vlog that I did where I read some of your favorite romances to decide whether I actually liked them or not. So basically all of these contemporaries were basically romance heavy as well. Three of the books were fantasy, four were historical fiction, one was horror, two were mystery, one was paranormal, one was sci-fi and 12 were thrillers. Now really quick, let me just explain how I'm kind of differentiating mystery and thriller because there is a lot of overlap between those two genres. I feel like in thriller suspense novels, there's definitely a mystery that is trying to be solved. And in a mystery, there's typically at least some level of suspense. But for my purposes, a mystery is going to definitely be like detective fiction where you have detectives who are trying to solve a crime. So mysteries are definitely focused on crime and justice and solving mysteries, whether in the past or in the present. Whereas I consider thriller suspense more about survival. So in thriller suspense novels, what keeps you on your seat is that anticipation of what is coming. So you as the reader and the main character is anticipating something happening, probably something negative, And that's what keeps you on the edge of your seat. You're not really sure what is coming. But in mysteries, the main character is not necessarily in danger. I mean, I guess it could happen later on down the road, but that's not really what it's about. It's not about survival. It's more about solving a crime. So that's kind of how I'm differentiating for this purpose, mysteries and thriller suspense novels. But typically when I'm talking about them on my channel and my wrap ups, I'm calling them mystery thrillers because I do see a lot of overlap between those genres. I did read two books that I feel like are more mysteries than suspense thrillers. And then I did read 12 suspense thrillers. In terms of ratings, I have not yet rated a book lower than three stars in 2023, which in some ways you could look at as a good thing. But as we've already established with the recent video that I did talking about how I rate books, three stars is not necessarily a stellar rating for me because I consider those utterly forgettable books. While my reading experience with a three star is definitely more positive than a two star rating, I am likely going to forget everything about those three star books but we're going to go ahead for the purpose of this, consider it positive overall because I don't have anything less than a three stars. So far I have rated 12 books, three stars, four books, 3.5 stars, 11 books, four stars, which is pretty positive. And what's really shocking to me is that I've already rated three books, 4.5 stars and three books, five stars. I think in 2022 in total, I had three five star reads throughout the entirety of the year. And then I had slightly more 4.5 star reads, but already in the first quarter, I've had six total books that I've rated 4.5 slash five stars. So, so far I feel like this is been a very, very strong reading year. And my overall average rating for the quarter was 3.7. I think the majority of my ratings are typically three and four stars, regardless of what year it is. So 3.7 is pretty standard. 
So far in 2023, I have not duplicated an author, meaning out of all of the 33 books that I have read, every single one of them has come from a different author, which is definitely astounding to me. I'm reading quite widely in terms of authors. Now I'm also keeping track of whether the books that I'm reading are books that I already owned and if I owned them, if they were gifted to me, whether I unhauled them after reading them, whether I purchased them after reading them, so on and so forth. As I mentioned previously, much of what I read these days is via audiobook. So even if I physically own the book, I'm more likely to listen to it on audio just because I don't have the time or the attention to actually sit down and read. And after I have listened to it, I will determine whether or not I want to keep the book or not. Or on the opposite end, because I'm trying to limit the books that I bring into my house that are unread, I might listen to a book and then decide whether or not I feel it's good enough to keep on my shelves. So out of the 33 books that I read, two of them I owned at the time that I read them, but I have since decided to unhaul them. 15 of them were owned and I have decided to keep them. Seven of them I listened to before owning them and I have since made the decision to purchase them. So they are now on my shelves. Seven of them were books that I didn't own and I will not be purchasing. And two of them were gifted to me. And basically I count anything that was sent to me that I did not actually purchase myself. So I am a part of a monthly Facebook gifting group. And so any book that I receive from that group, I consider gifted. Another thing that I really wanted to keep track of was publication year, because y'all know that I'm trying to read backlist titles. And I've been doing a really great job of that so far. Out of the 33 books that I've read so far, only three have been from 2023 published years. And that's because those are books that are being sent to me in book boxes. And I'm trying to read most of those as they come in. So those are naturally going to be the new releases that I am reading. Aside from that, I have read 12 from 2022. That's by far been the highest year is 2022. Three have been from 2021. Three also for 2020. Four from 2019. Three from 2018. One from 2017. One from 2016. And then we definitely have some anomalies. I have one from 2006, which was that paranormal romance that I read just to give it a try and I didn't really love. And then of course, Emma by Jane Austen was published in 1815. So we know we're likely not going to see another 1815 on here. Next, I quickly just want to briefly touch upon series and how I'm doing because another big goal of mine for 2023 was to kind of work on the series that I've been in progress with for a long time because I want to get those done. And so that way I don't feel quite as guilty when I'm starting new series. So, so far in the first quarter of 2023, I have completed three series. I completed the Curse Breaker trilogy by Bridget Kemmerer. I completed the Stalking Jack the Ripper series by Carrie Maniscalco. And I also completed the Nevernight Chronicles by Jay Kristoff. I have also made the decision to DNF some of the series that I originally planned to continue with but have since decided that I don't really feel the need to waste my time on series that I'm not excited about. I will not be continuing with The Remnant Chronicles by Mary E. Pearson. I only had one book left in that trilogy but in all honesty I just don't care. I'm not looking forward to reading the story. It's something that's actually causing me stress and anxiety which is not something that I want to feel in terms of reading a book. I think I've also made the decision to DNF the Fable series by Adrian Young. I know that there's like an official title to that series but the first book in that was Fable. I actually really really liked Fable. I enjoyed it a lot and that made me want to continue with the series. I believe it's a trilogy if I'm not mistaken. And again, it's not that I didn't enjoy it because I really did, but it's more a matter of this is a young adult series that I wasn't fully invested in. And it's not a series that I feel like I need to continue. There are a bunch of other series that I would much rather spend my time on. And so I don't think I'm going to continue. I will absolutely be keeping Fable on my shelves because that was a very enjoyable reading experience for me, but not to the point where I'm actively excited to continue. And on that same note, I think I might be DNFing the Off Campus series by L. Kennedy. This is one that I'm still wishing washi on because I really enjoyed the deal. I liked it a lot. It was surprisingly a lot harder hitting than I thought it was going to be. The mistake I don't remember enjoying as much but I also remember being very distracted while reading that story and so it could definitely have been a case of it's me and not the book but the point is is that I'm not looking forward to continuing. It's not something that I anticipate. It's not something that I'm like ooh, the next book in the off-campus series I can't wait to read that. That's not the case. Instead it's just kind of sitting on my shelves being like oh I guess I should probably finish it because I only have like two books left to finish it. So please comment down below and let me know if you think that continuing this series is worth it because like I said I did really enjoy the deal and from what I remember of the mistake it was overall an enjoyable reading experience as well. I just don't know if it's got me enough to want to continue. So I formally completed three series. I've possibly DNF'd three series so that's six in total and I have also started two series. I've started the Alex Stern series by Lee Bardugo the first book being Ninth House and I've also started the Skyward series by Brandon Sanderson and I have plans to finish a lot of the series that I I've started during Slayer Fest. So hopefully by the end of the quarter to wrap up, there are even more positive statistics with regard to this one. Now I kind of want to get into some of the reading challenges that I set for myself. There are some of them that are very, very casual that I don't care whether or not I complete. I'm just kind of filling them in as I read books, but there are a handful that I'm intentionally completing and I'm intentionally finding books that will satisfy these challenges. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. The first of course is the 23 in 23 list that I made in December where I picked 23 books that I absolutely 
had to read in 2023 that actually ended up being closer to 27, 28 books that I wanted to read in 2023 because I realized that I was only one or maybe two books away from completing a lot of other series and I went ahead and added those onto the list as well. I will say that I think I'm doing very, very well in this challenge. I'm almost 41% through. I have physically completed and read nine of these books. And then of course, since I'm not going to be completing the Remnant Chronicles and I'm not going to be completing that series by Adrian Young, the two books that were on that list from those series, I've automatically marked as completed because I'm actually not going to be reading them. And so they are no longer there as books that I need to read. So, so far we are only 25% of the way through the year and I've completed 40% of this challenge. And like I said, far more of these will be satisfied during Slayer Fest. So at the halfway point throughout the year, I expect to be a lot further along in these challenges. Similarly, I made a list of 16 authors that I wanted to read in 2023 because they had just kind of been hanging out on my radar for a really long time and I'd never picked anything up by them. And I wanted to actually read something by these authors to determine whether or not they deserved to remain on my radar. This is another one that I feel I'm doing very well in. I am 43.75% of the way through this challenge. I have read seven of the 16 authors, so I only have one more to go before I'm at the halfway point. This again is another one where I will satisfy definitely more by the end of Slayer Fest, so I'm excited to get through that. I am also, of course, participating in the Buzzword Reading Challenge. This is a challenge that was created by Books and Lala. Originally, if I remember correctly, it was created as a readathon, and now it is a yearly challenge where every month there is a different buzzword that you have to look for within the title. I'm not approaching this challenge as, you know, reading one of these every single month. More like, I do have a set list of books that I plan to read for this challenge, and I'm going to read them as I read them and satisfy the challenge as I do it. So sometimes there might be zero in a month, sometimes there might be two or three in a month, I don't know. But I've already satisfied four of the 12, which I'm pretty satisfied with. And again, this is another challenge that will see multiple more spots filled by the end of Slayer Fest. The other two main challenges that I'm working on is the Around the World and 52 Books Challenge and the 52 Book Club Reading Challenge. So basically, as the name suggests, there are 52 prompts for each, so 104 between them, and I'm trying to satisfy all 104 of those challenges. I have not yet put these challenges in the spreadsheet that I'm using because I only just now recently made the decision to switch from a physical planner. I was using the Always Fully Booked Reading Planner, and I just decided that it was too much of a hassle for me to like lug this thing around and remember to update it on a regular basis, whereas I am constantly in like Google Sheets updating things, and I felt like it was more productive and efficient for me to just go ahead and switch to that digital format, even though I do like the tactile nature of putting pen to paper. I just am not as great at keeping up with a physical planner as I would be with a digital one. And I worked on that a lot yesterday. That's what I did a lot of the time in putting all of the books read, trying to update a lot of the challenges, my series tracker, all of that, trying to put it into the spreadsheet. And I just did not have enough time to do that before filming this video. So I do not have a concrete number as to how many of the challenges that I've satisfied for each of these two. If I have that information by the time that I post this video, I will post the numbers for each on the screen. But those are two that I'm also working diligently towards. Some of the more casual ones that I'm participating are the 50 states challenge where you try to read a book from each one of the 50 states or also the alphabet challenge where you try to read a book A through Z throughout the year or things like that. Those are ones that I really I'm not really chuffed about as I read them. If I satisfy the challenge is great. If I don't, I don't. So I'm not really planning on including my progress in this video. And then of course the best and the worst of the quarter. Out of the three five star reads that I've assigned for the first quarter, I would say that the strongest for me was absolutely Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff. That completed the Nevernight Chronicles trilogy. It's one of my favorite fantasy series of all time and I just love it with my whole heart and soul. Those characters, Jay Kristoff's humor and writing were just phenomenal. I was sobbing by the end of the story because of just how beautiful it was and just saying goodbye to the characters gutted me emotionally. So by far Dark Dawn is the strongest so far of quarter one. And then like I said, I haven't really rated anything below a three star. So there's nothing that truly stands out as like the worst book. But just in terms of like overall negative feelings that I have, I would probably say the worst for me from quarter one is probably a tie between Killers of a Certain Age by Deanna Rayborn, Cake by Jay Begnston, and The Final Revival of Opal and Neb by Donnie Walton. All of these books had the potential to be so, so much stronger than they were. I had much higher expectations going into them than what I was given. And so ultimately they were just a big disappointment. And I think that's why I want to include them here as the worst. They had the potential to be so much more, but the author decided to take these books to really weird and unusual places that I really don't think that they needed to be. And so for that, I'm going to consider those the worst so far of the year. All right, and then really quickly, I wanted to run through what I've been watching so far in quarter one. And that way at the end of the year, I don't have to wrap up absolutely everything that I've been watching. I can do it in quarterly bursts. So starting with what I've been watching with my husband, if you are not familiar, my husband and I at dinner every single night, we sit down and watch an episode of whatever we are watching at the time. We have a very sophisticated popsicle stick system where we have a cup full of popsicle sticks that contain all of the shows that we are watching or want to watch. And we will pick a new popsicle stick at the 
the ending of every season of a show and then proceed to watch the season of that show. And we do that just to keep things interesting, to keep things fresh, to keep it so we're not watching the same thing over and over and over again. And to make sure that every show is kind of getting equal attention. Although there could be years between seasons of a show if we don't like actually pull one of the popsicle sticks. But it's just been a fun system that works for us. We started the year by watching season seven of Supernatural. He and I are re-watching Supernatural together. Both he and I have seen up until probably I would say like nine and ten separately. But because it had been many years for both of us since we last watched a season of Supernatural and we wanted to kind of be fresh and caught up before we moved into the last few seasons and I know Supernatural is now over, we did go ahead and make the decision to re-watch it together. So we have currently finished season seven and we'll be going into season eight the next time a Supernatural popsicle stick is chosen. We did also complete season five of the 100 and y'all the 100 is definitely one of my new favorite television shows of all time. I cannot explain it but the intensity of that show is real. Like every single time we are watching that show I am just like on the edge of my seat every single episode. It is so stressful and anxiety inducing watching that show. It's a young adult dystopian sci-fi show and I just think it's really really good. And then we are currently watching season one of Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy is one of my favorite television shows of all time. I have watched it through twice. It ended in 2014 and then I re-watched it I believe it was in 2015 or 2016 so it has been many years since I've watched the show but it's also a show that's emotionally devastating for me because I love it so much and there's so much death in that show. Only recently did I feel confident enough to add it to our popsicle stick system so Sons of Anarchy has been in there for the past several months. We finally drew it and we are now watching season one. It is amazing being back in that world with these characters but it's also heart-wrenching at the same time because I know it's coming but I wanted to introduce my husband to the show since he's never seen it. So we are currently in the middle of season one. We will likely be finishing that within the next few days and then it's on to the next popsicle stick. And then y'all know if I'm watching anything by myself it's likely going to be a true crime documentary of some sort and that has been no different this year. There are only like a handful of drama shows that I watch on my own. That's typically not something that I can like allow myself to do. I don't allow myself to just sit and watch shows and I'm never in the proper mindset where I just want to like binge and be obsessed with the show. Long story short if I'm watching something it's typically a true crime show. The first one that I watched for 2023 was a show on Netflix called The Vatican Girl. It follows the disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi. She was the daughter of people who worked in the Vatican so they actually lived in the Vatican and one day she just went missing. There were all kinds of speculations going on about why she was kidnapped. Like was she kidnapped as a bargaining chip for like people inside the Vatican to do what the kidnappers wanted. It was also thought that she could have been kidnapped by the Italian mob but I think the ultimate conclusion is that there was some kind of conspiracy within the Vatican that got her kidnapped and killed. So that was overall kind of really interesting especially when you think of the fact that they are literally inside the Vatican. And so it's really interesting to think of some of the shady things that could be going on within the Vatican. Next I watched Wild Crime A Murder in Yosemite. So Wild Crime is a series on Hulu and it documents crime that take place in national parks. So the first season of that I believe took place in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and this took place in Yosemite which is a national park in California. It discusses bones that were found there and all of the investigative avenues that they took to try to find out whose bones these were and who could have possibly killed them. Another one that I watched simply to become more familiar with the actual crime because I've heard so much about it over the years. I watched Madoff the Monster of Wall Street. Madoff basically instructed and pulled off the biggest Ponzi scheme in history and so this was the talk about him and his rise and his fall. I didn't know much about it but Madoff is so notorious that I wanted to go ahead and watch it to learn more about his crimes and just to see like the devastation that it actually caused his family was pretty heart-wrenching. That was a pretty short one as well. It was only four episodes and I recommend if you are interested in that kind of crime area. One that I really really liked was How I Caught My Killer on Hulu. It was nine episodes and it literally details crimes that were solved because of something the deceased had done before they died. Like some kind of little clue that they had left that ultimately led police to their killer. I thought that it was so well done and I know that this is an odd point to mention but the music in that was stunning. The music was really really good and I just thought it was so inspiring and powerful to see how these victims got the last word. To see how they helped people catch their killer. So it was a really beautiful series on Hulu if you are interested in that one. Another really great one that I enjoyed on Hulu was called Web of Death. That series was six episodes long and it focused on the armchair detectives. So the people online who have actually helped solved crimes. What I really loved about this one was that one of the episodes was focused on Bob Ruff. Bob Ruff is the host of one of my favorite true crime podcasts called Truth and Justice. On that podcast he and his team dive deeply deeply into crimes where he believes somebody is wrongfully incarcerated. He has actually helped people get exonerated from prison with his podcast and one of those cases was featured in this documentary. So I was just so beyond proud to see Bob 
Labra featured in this documentary. If you have not listened to his podcast, I highly recommend because you will get deep, intricate investigations. And I think that it's just like fantastic and that more people need to be doing this work because innocent people are sent to prison all of the time. And like more and more people need to be aware that this can actually happen. False confessions can actually happen. People confess to crimes that they didn't do all of the time because of external pressures and promises and things of that nature. So I just really loved that Bob Ruff was featured in this documentary. I just love the overall focus on these armchair detectives. That's another great one on Hulu. Hulu has had some outstanding true crime documentaries recently. Another longer one that was 10 episodes on Netflix is called My Lover, My Killer. It's exactly what it sounds. It details crimes where primarily women, but I believe there was at least one man featured, were killed by their intimate partner. So it focuses heavily on intimate partner violence. It was very tragic to watch, but I also think it's very important to watch. So that was another great one that I recommend. A brief one on Hulu that was four episodes was called Still Missing Morgan. This is about a little girl. I believe she was about five or six at the time, but she was kidnapped in the mid nineties and she has never been found. She's never been found alive and she's never been found dead. This was spotlighting the history of the case, the investigation that has gone on so far, the avenues that they have taken and everything that they are trying to do to find Morgan who is still missing. And then the final one that I have to talk to you about today is a recent documentary that was released on Netflix. It was only three episodes long. It was called The Murdoch Murders. If you're not familiar, this follows a very infamous South Carolina family called the Murdoch's. They're really, really big where they are because they're like very prominent, well-respected attorneys. They hold a lot of power in this town and you find out what happens as a result of that power, the things that they are able to get away with. It details like multiple deaths that are surrounding this family and it was really, really interesting. There's also uh, at least one podcast detailing the crimes surrounding this family as well. So that was another interesting one. All right, y'all, that is it. I think that's all that I have for you today for my quarter one wrap up. So far, I feel like it has been a very successful reading year. I'm definitely satisfying a lot of the challenges that I've set for myself. I'm reading a lot of fantastic books. I haven't really gotten any huge duds for the year so far, and I'm hoping that this continues. Please be sure to comment down below and let me know how your first quarter of reading went. I would love to know. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and a third video to film. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Thank you.